the last speakers. Thanks again to the organizers for organizing both this and all the other excellent rifting sessions. And I'd also like to note that again, this work is done in collaboration with quite a few people who I'll be mentioning as, uh, as we go on. The last thing to note is that um, this is really the geodynamic perspective on the influence of fault rheology and multiphase rifting. And I'm gonna start by contrasting what the difference is between sort of the geodynamic modeling perspective and the observational perspective of, of, of sort of normal fault evolution in the upper crust. If you look at this image of sort of fault, um, normal fault evolution and linkage, this is from a recent paper by Sophie Pond, but the image is based on um, a conceptual model from Garth, um, Gothorpe and Leader. What you see is that this, could, this sort of um, fault interaction growth and linkage could happen over hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years. It sort of depends on what time scale you're thinking of. But the important thing to remember is that faults and fault networks develop through repeated earthquake cycles. So faults. And then also that faults in the upper crust, they're typically not that wide, unless maybe you're at the plate boundary scale and looking at like a, you know, like something like the Alpine faults, the San Andreas fault, or a subduction channel. And the widths are on the order of meters to tens of meters. And when I say brittle rheology, what I'm basically talking about here is the strength of the faults, so the friction and cohesion. Although again, if you think about the evolution of faults um, through geologic time, that strength is probably highly time dependent in thinking about, if you think about processes like dynamic weakening and right state friction. There, now it's advancing. Yep, so then if you contrast to um, sort of geodynamic models of fault evolution, then what this image right here is showing is basically, this is showing the active strain rate in the 3D um, thermomechanical model of continental extension. This is after 10 million years of rifting at a rate of five millimeters per year. And basically the coloring here is showing the areas of the highest um, strain rates. So basically this is the location where you have the most concentrated deformation. This is the locations of the faults. The important thing to realize with a model like this is it's very different from nature in a couple of key ways. And number one, the earthquake cycle is not included. So our time steps are on the order of hundreds to thousands of years. And so basically we're skipping over the earthquake cycle. The faults are typically much wider um, depending on your numerical resolution. The shear zones may be on the order of anywhere from hundreds to thousands of meters. And we also need to prescribe some form of strain weakening in order to localize these faults. And so then how is this sort of modeling typically done? I always think it's good to give an overview of how this works is the starting point, if you would like to do this kind of modeling, is you would choose some software to model these thermal tectonic processes in 3D. And fortunately now, there is a wonder of riches in the modeling world in terms of software. Um, there are four codes, Aspect, LMM, PTOT, and 3D, and Underworld, and probably a, a few others now, which are open source, um, very well documented, well tested, and can run these kind of highly nonlinear models in 3D efficiently over hundreds to thousands, in some cases, tens of thousands of processors. And so that's a very good thing for the community that we have so many excellent options for software at this point for modeling these kind of processes. And all of the images and work I'm here, I'm using Aspect, but all of these four codes can have very similar features and can model the same processes. Then once you've selected the code you're using, um, then you solve typically the, like the broad scale work that you do is you solve the Stokes equation. This gives you the velocity and pressure model. And then in combination with that, you'd solve the vection diffusion equation. This is what gives you the time dependence to, and to look at the evolution of temperature. And you also, also can use um, the velocity field for material tracking. So either on particles or fields to track different lithologies. The key to that in thinking about the theme of this um, session and thinking about rheology is in order to get the velocity and pressure and relate temperature to basically the flow field, you just need, you just need to prescribe a rheological model. Typically what we do is we prescribe a nonlinear viscoplastic or viscoelastic plastic constitutive relationship. And this is a sort of typical setup you would see for these kind of models where then this is just a 2D profile, I'll be showing you 3D results where then you prescribe some velocities to, for an extension to drive flow outwards. You might have some inflow at the base. You have different lithologies with different density prop, um, thermodynamic properties and rheological properties. And within there, the rheology for just the viscoplastic case would be, could be prescribed by, by some combination of diffusion and dislocation creep 
and plasticity. And it's the combination of these, of these two rheological descriptions, which is gonna give us these different strength profiles as a function of temperature. And then of course, strain rate, there's an assumption about strain rate in here. And so then thinking about plasticity, which is gonna be the focus of the talk, you can prescribe very simply with like a drucker prager yield criterion where the yield stress is equal, is a combination of the pressure, the friction coefficient, and the cohesion. And it's straightforward with a viscosity rescaling re method to get basically a plastic viscosity, which is would represent the low strength within brittle shear zones. But the key point here, and what you'll see on this curve right here, is there's basically two strength profiles drawn. One is for basically if you have a friction angle of 30 degrees, and one if you have 15 degrees. And you need, in these models, you need weakening of the friction and, and in some cases, cohesion over time in order to localize deformation effectively. So we call this plasticity. And so I put a note here, plasticity with strain weakening. With strain weakening. And what I'm going to talk about in the rest of the talk is basically the effect of the strain weakening, how we parameterize it on both single and multi-phase rifting in these kind of models. And so what are the effects of the brittle strain weakening parameterization, specifically the magnitude, in some cases, the rate. So these two images right here, this is showing um, two continental rifting models where, um, where on the left-hand side, we weaken the friction and cohesion angle from 30 to 15 degrees over time. And on the right, we work, weaken it from 30 to 7.5 degrees over time. I will note that actually here, we start out with some initial plastic strain. And so there's already strength perturbations in the model. And this was helps localize deformation in the model center. But the key thing to take away from this is as you increase the magnitude of brittle strain weakening, we're also weakening the cohesion here, but really the key effect is the weakening of the friction. As you, in this case, we have a two times weakening. In this case, we have a four times weakening. Basically increasing this magnitude of brittle strain weakening, it promotes strain localization. So here you go from a more distributed rift and here you go to a completely different structural style where you have two distinct rift basins and you have fewer faults and you have deformation much more highly localized. I will note eventually in this model, one of these rift basins does take over. And this is just a subset of the uh, one model in terms of the spatial dimensions. You can also, that, and so that's a very qualitative assessment, you can also quantify the effects of brittle rheology. This is work being led by Sophie Pond in Imperial College and also Rebecca Bell at Imperial College and Chris Jackson at the University of Manchester. And this is the results from a 3D model. So you're looking at basically um, a horizontal plane at five kilometers depth. This is about, um, and so this is about 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers. You're looking at basically these colors represent, um, it's coloring the geometric moment on distinct faults. What Sophie Pond did here, she used image processing techniques to automatically determine where basically each fault is located. And once you do that, you can basically extract information from these fault systems and look at some quantitative statistics. So what this is doing going from left to right, this is a reference model where the rate of strain weakening, brittle strain weakening was two times. So we'll call this our reference model. In this case, and the plot here is looking at the, geo, the geometric moment, basically in a scaling relationship. So basically the number of faults with the given geometric moment. The key point to take away from this is that basically as you increase the rate of fault weakening, so basically not changing the magnitude, but increasing how quickly it happens, or what you can also do is again, increase the magnitude. So here the rate is the same, but we are weakening four times instead of two times, is you completely change the scaling distribution for the total fault populations. And so basically increasing the rate or increasing the magnitude of strain weakening, you're promoting strain localization again, you're promoting fewer faults and you're promoting faults with higher offsets on them. You can see this both visually very clearly here and here, but also quantitatively as well. So, but what I really would like to focus on in the talk is multi-phase rifting and the effect of brittle rheology during, as you transition between these different phases. So what is a natural example of multi-phase rifting? Basically every rift I think goes through distinct phase, I would, I would call every rift a multi-phase rift. But specifically what um, I mean here is that a multi-phase rift represent, is a rift which undergoes a change in rift velocity. This could be the magnitude, or the orientation through time that that leads us to distinct phases of rifting, which you can observe structurally. One uh, very classic example of this is the Gulf of California, where then you started with orthogonal basin range style extension, and eventually you transitioned basically without too many breaks 
to a highly, um, to a moderately oblique and highly, um, and then finally to a, um, I'm sorry, you start out with orthogonal extension in the first stage, and then you transition to a moderately oblique system, and then eventually a highly oblique system. And also as that orientation is changing, um, the magnitude of, or, or the rate of extension is also increasing. Another classic example would be in the North Sea. This is a structural interpretation of what was happening in parts of the North Sea by Tom Phillips et al. And what happened in the North Sea is that you had a very early phase of extension, you had a period of sort of tectonic quiescence and cooling, and then a second phase of extension developed. And in that case, you have very distinct structural styles and multiple phases of faulting with distinct orientations. So again, the question is, what is the effect of um, basically strain, brittle strain weakening through time? On you have this? 10 minutes now, John. Great, thank you. And so then you can look at this um, um, through both analog and numerical modeling. So a classic, a, re a very recent example of this um, from Wang et al, um, 2021, is in the analog models, what they do is they impose multiple phases of extension. These are kinematically imposed phases of extension. And what they're looking at here in the, these two separate models is in the first phase of extension, you either have two or three centimeters of uh, basically total extension. And that has a large influence on the final fault populations. In this case, you have the formation of new faults. In this case, you have preferred reactivation of, um, or I, I'd say preferred slip on the pre existing faults. Another example is from Petula Vanadu et al. Um, this is a work which is currently in review, but they very kindly put it on Earth Archive. And the focus of this paper was actually to look at basically um, landscape evolution during multi-phase rifting, but they have these very nice examples um, from discrete element models showing that um, if this is your first phase, this is a model with a single phase of extension, but then this is a model where you have multiple phase extensions. This is the end of the first phase, then you change the boundary conditions and you get very distinct fault populations between this model and this model. So, but what I wanna show here in with relatively new models, this is work in progress in collaboration with Scott Bennett, the USGS, Mike Oskin at UC Davis, and Sophie Pond at Imperial College, the end goal of this is actually to look at the evolution of the Gulf of California. This is sort of, sort of the work we did leading up to the models, specifically examining the Gulf of California. But we wanted to understand how fault rheology affected very simple two-phase rifting scenarios. So basically models where you start out with a single orthogonal phase, and the way this model is going to work is we're going to have, is going to, we're going to run these 3D models. They're 500 by 500 by 100 kilometers. We're going to first have an orthogonal phase at five millimeters per year for five millimeters, and then we're going to have an oblique phase, which is also at a rate of five millimeters per year, but it's then the orientation is going to be at 30 or 60 degrees. So this green, um, and so the green arrows are representing the second phase. And we're going to run this for 2.5 million years. And we're going to look at magnitudes of brittle strain weakening of two or four times and contrast the results. Now, one thing to note here is the model is 500 by 500 kilometers, which is basically, it's related, this is a map view of the, of the fault patterns you get on the very first climb step. But what we're gonna focus on in the rest of the um, images is basically this high resolution right here. So the resolution in this area is 1.25 kilometers in the outer regions here, it's five kilometers. So we basically use a sort of embedded mesh structure to give us natural boundary conditions on either end of the rift. So, this is the case where we have moderate strain weakening, brittle strain weakening two times, and the friction angle is going from 30 to 15 degrees. So this is the end of the first orthogonal rift phase, and you see sort of this classic example where you have distributed um, normal faulting. In, um, it's, it's, I mean, you do have some sort of complicated fault linkage, but to first order, this is sort of a classic pattern you would see during an initial orthogonal rift phase. And then what we do is after we switch to an oblique phase at 30 degrees, so it's moderately oblique, what you tend to see, although some of the original faults are still being, are still active, overall, you see the switch in orientation of the fault. So the key conclusion here is you have preferred development of faults with new orientations. We're still in the process of, quantitative, of quantitatively analyzing these models using image processing. So, um, so fairly soon we'll have some very specific numbers describing um, the percentage of faults which are either being um, reactivated or new faults developing. So this is the same scenario, but in this case, what we have, we're looking at the end of the oblique phase, uh, the end of the second rifting phase, but in this case, the oblique was 60 degrees. And again, what you see is you see primarily the development of faults with new orientations. 
Now contrast this to a case where you have strong brittle strain weakening and you're going from a friction angle of 30 degrees to 7.5 degrees. The first thing to note, this is the end of the first orthogonal phase, and you already notice a difference there where you have much stronger localization on just at the end of the orthogonal phase, and you have much more complicated linkage patterns. But then again, if we look at the end of the second oblique phase of extension, the patterns to first order look roughly the same. There is some development of new fault sort of linking structures right here, or maybe, or maybe the rate of deformation on the distinct structures has changed. But overall, when you have strong brittle strain weakening in these multi-phase rifting scenarios, it's gonna pr promote continued localization on previously active faults. And so you're not gonna have a, a large amount of new fault development in the scenario. And it's effectively the same story when you have increased the obliquity to 60 degrees. Although in this case right here, you're starting to actually see some development of new structures right here, but these are secondary structures. They're basically linking basically faults which had orientations which would accommodate this new obliquity phase or basically new faults are developing to link these structures. Overall though, if you look at the orientations of the major structures, they're still roughly in line with what you saw during the first rifting phase. So the conclusions in future directions, again, this work was building up to sort of looking at larger scale model the evolution of Gulf of California. And this is what this model is showing right here. This is very sort of hot off the presses work. But in this case, we have a transition from orthogonal rifting. That's where the beginning of this movie begins is, um, to highly oblique rifting. But the velocity is also increasing over time. And you see these really interesting development uh, fault patterns, which are also uh, somewhat orthorhombic in nature. And you do have development of strike slip faults in the model center here. But the key takeaways from this is the parameterization of the brittle fault rheology and strain weakening in geodynamic models. It has a first order effect on the dynamics of fault evolution. I hope that was not a surprise to anyone. But then the other key takeaway is that if you increase the magnitude of fault weakening in these multi-phase rift models, it can produce a transition between either new fault development or continued localization on previously active faults. So then again, this is very preliminary work, but I think the really interesting frontier in this is actually going back to the first two talks is to think about how basically fault weakening the upper crust is linking into the ductal deformation in the mid, in the mid to lower crust. And so thinking about the processes like brain size evolution and fluid transport. So in order to do that, I think you can look at ancient rifts some degree, but I think there are a lot of exciting opportunities and active rifts to focus on these processes. So either in the East Africa rift or places like the Gulf of, um, Gulf of of California and the Eastern California shear zone and the edge of the basin range. And hopefully that'll lead to the examination of some new physics and improving these models. All right, that's it. Thanks everyone. Thanks, John. So I see already there's a question in the chat for you from Cynthia Avenger. She says, early stage rifts and strong lithosphere show a half graben morphology that may persist for five to 10 million years. Faults in homogeneous lithosphere, regardless of rheology, don't create or maintain half graben. If you change the interactions between and include erosion and deposition, could your models generate a half graben basin? Oh yeah, it probably could, Cynthia. And my guess is, is that as we increase the resolution of these models, so then in the model Sophie Pond has run, um, um, they're actually more half graben generated, but they were generated, those models were run at a very high resolution. So the models I, the last series of models I showed you, they were run at, at, at um, 1.25 kilometer spacing. Sophie ran them at four times that um, resolution and she got, and I believe she got more half robins. And so then, but to answer your question, Cynthia, my guess is yes. Um, if you want to include surface processes coupling in these models, that could change the dynamics quite a bit. And there's actually multiple groups looking at this now. So hopefully we'll have more answers to that question soon. Okay, I also see Follerin raised uh, his hand, uh, and also Robert. I'm conscious of time, so uh, I know some people might need to leave in a moment, but perhaps we can get through a couple of quick questions. Um, okay, I can go. Um, so, uh, John, nice presentation. My question is about the effect of um, crustal and lithospheric healing on yes. the fault patterns you see in the interface, the interrift phase period, you know, if it is prolonged, it cross becomes stronger and little becomes stronger. How, how does that, if, you know, influence the fault patterns? Um, 
Well, so I guess there's two competing processes there. And, and so then one thing I didn't even, I mentioned this talk because there wasn't time and because I haven't looked at that much and it's even hard to parameterize is healing of the faults over time. Particularly, I mean, once a fault becomes inactive, you could presume maybe there is some weakening going on immediately. And in the case of like the North Sea where you have millions of years in between, even tens of millions of years in between rifting phases, you would expect some of those faults to heal. And so the short answer on that part of the question is, it probably has an effect. I have no idea how to parameterize it. And I have not seen any convincing argument for how to parameterize it. If someone has an idea for a, a good um, geologic based or observational based um, parameterization for fault healing over millions of years, I would love to hear it and please email, <laughs> please message me immediately. Um, sort of the second part of that is the question is, is that over time in between, if you have if you have cooling between rifting phases, the entire lithosphere is cooling down. And what we found in the past is that basically that can promote basically rift jumping. So then if you had significant thinning of the crust in some places and you had basically, basically, um, yeah, thinning of the crust and thicker sections of mantle in some areas, if you cool it down enough, you can actually change the large scale strength contrast between different parts of the rift and that can lead to rift jumps. Of course, there are also other things, much more complicated things going on with the brittle, or I'm sorry, with the ductal rheology, but I think we're sort of just at the cusp of understanding all those interactions. Thanks. Thanks, okay. Um, Bob, would you like to ask a very, very quick question? Very quick, I can ask it quickly. My intuition says that the, uh, upper crustal deformation you're describing is a consequence of lower crustal deformation or, or yes, lower ductal stuff and, and not independent of it. And I think yes. your presentation was independent. There is a ductal rheology present. And so then we had dislocation creep. Um, um, and, and so then the area is not um, yielding brittly. There is in the upper crust, there is dislocation creep following a quartz flow law. In the, in the lower crust, there is a, a dislocation creep following um, wet anorthite. And then the mantle, we have something based on olivine. The really big, I think the really big frontier is tying what's happening with faults in the upper crust to grain size evolution and shear zone development in the lower crust. But again, we are very in 3D or even in 2D. But again, I think we are very much just at the beginning of putting all of those different pieces into the numerical models. Once you start putting all those different things in together, it gets really hard to tease out what's happening. But I think we are just at the beginning of beginning to understand the sort of complicated reactions. But I, can, I, I agree completely in that basically a lot of what's happening at the press is probably strongly linked to the lower crust. Okay, so I think we ought to wrap up there. So thanks to all speakers once again for very interesting talks today. 